Make sure you never miss an FX Medicine episode by subscribing to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. You can also follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Hi, and welcome to FX Medicine, where we bring you the latest in evidence-based, integrative, functional, and complementary medicine. FX Medicine acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, where we live and work, and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Joining us on the line today is Dr. Brad Leach, an internationally recognised integrative medicine practitioner. After entering the functional medicine profession in 2008, Brad has taught and developed subjects at leading academic institutions in integrative gastroenterology, naturopathic medicine, nutritional and dietetic medicine and public health research. Brad is the lead clinical educator and co-creator of CoBiome. In addition to his research and working with patients, Brad offers practitioner support through his mentoring program, Brad's Brainiacs. Welcome back to FX Medicine, Brad. Lisa, it's fantastic to be uh, chatting with you again. It's always a privilege to be here on FX Medicine. Oh, we love having you and we always learn so much. So today we're talking about autoimmune diseases, which we know are on the rise. And current statistics suggest approximately 5% of the population worldwide has at least one autoimmune condition. Now, while some of the factors that predispose an individual to an autoimmune condition, such as genetic susceptibility, are largely out of our control, other risk factors, such as optimal gut health, are very much modifiable. In fact, 2,500 years ago, Hippocrates stated that all disease begins in the gut. And certainly gut health is a logical place to start when trying to modify an autoimmune disease. And that's what we're going to explore today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, Brad, you have published a research article on digestive health and autoimmune disease. Can you tell us a little bit more about your key findings and also what led you to look specifically at the link between autoimmunity and the gut? I read a paper by Dr. Vasano, and basically he proposed that if we corrected one of these potential risk factors for autoimmunity, and that is increased intestinal permeability, then the autoimmunity wouldn't continue and it would reduce. Mm. And so I I spent a number of years focusing on intestinal permeability, and that just kind of led on further and further to all the other components of gut health Mm. and uh, autoimmune disease. So now, yes, I have fallen into the cliche of a (laughs) practitioner focusing on gut health, but I've been doing it for years and years and years, and I can tell you all disease begins in the gut. (laughs) So with that said, um, I was involved in uh, a research paper. Now, it's a two-part article called Diet, Digestive Health, and Autoimmunity, Mm -hmm. the Foundations to an Autoimmune Disease Food Pyramid. Now, the first, let's say part one, explains what we refer to as modifiable risk factors for the development and exacerbation of an autoimmune disease. Mm. Now, we went in with a very open mind going, okay, what are all the potential risk factors that we as practitioners can address in our patients who have an autoimmune disease or at risk of having an autoimmune disease? Now, we looked through all of the different literature and we came up with four modifiable risk factors, and they include increased intestinal permeability, Mm -hmm. aka leaky gut, inflammation, dysbiosis, and immune dysregulation. And so these four modifiable risk factors, they almost feed off each other Mm -hmm. in the sense of when there is inflammation, that can drive permeability. When there's dysbiosis, that can um, drive immune dysregulation. So Mm -hmm. they have this cross-link between each other where they all drive one another. Mm. Now, that was part one. Part two, we then looked at all of the different diets. And so basically, we did a literature search and going, okay, show me all of the dietary interventions 
in patients with an autoimmune condition. We, we opened it up to all autoimmune conditions because mm. we know as, as um, integrative practitioners that, you know, it's, it's, if you've got uh, inflammatory bowel disease, it's not just about working with a gastroenterologist. It's mm. about looking at the whole picture. And so we look at, we group these autoimmune conditions as one, mm -hmm. okay, in a sense. And so we looked at different diets, the Mediterranean diet, the vegetarian diet, the vegan diet, the gluten-free diet, the paleo diet, mm -hmm. and also the um, low arachidonic acid diet, also known as the anti-inflammatory diet. Now, based on this research, we actually put forward what a food pyramid may look like for an individual with a autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. We know here in Australia and in other developed countries that we have food, uh, food pyramids or, or even plates, but they're not targeted at disease states. Let's take um, uh, cardiovascular disease where they give recommendations about uh, reducing saturated fats and reducing salts and so forth. But no one's actually gone and gone, what does a diet look like for a patient with an autoimmune disease? Mm. So to summarise what we found was somebody with an active autoimmune disease the most effective diet would be a gluten-free diet, mm -hmm. which is high in fibre, yep. that has plenty of seafood mm -hmm. and has a max of 150 grams of arachidonic acid-containing foods each day. Mm -hmm. Now, while in practice, if a patient has an autoimmune disease, I will address these four modifiable risk factors, mm -hmm. intestinal permeability, inflammation, dysbiosis, and, of course, immune dysregulation. Mm, okay, very interesting. So with those recommendations that you just suggested, so less than 150 grams of arachidonic acid producing foods, what are some arachidonic acid producing foods and yeah. what would that look like in terms of specifics like X amount of cheese or meat or so on? So arachidonic acid, um, for those who don't know, is call it the opposite of omega-3. Mm -hmm. Omega-3 is anti-inflammatory, broadly speaking, and arachidonic acid is pro-inflammatory, broadly speaking. Mm. So some of the most richest sources of uh, arachidonic acid are going to be things like eggs and turkey, uh, goats, lamb, chicken, and so forth. Now, th there's different varying amounts. So give you, to give you an example, what we're trying to achieve here is 90 milligrams or less of arachidonic acid per day. But if you go telling that to a patient and they need to count it, it mm. it's going to be too difficult. So what we've done is we've taken the, the mean average of um, arachidonic acid-containing food, which is basically land-based animals, and we've gone, what's the mean average of that? So, for example, 100 grams – or no, sorry, 150 grams of chicken eggs contains about – 50 to 60 um, milligrams of arachidonic acid, where mm. something like uh, 100 grams of beef will contain about 200 milligrams of arachidonic acid. So mm. it varies. Mm -hmm. So we came up with this 150 grams, not of arachidonic acid, but of arachidonic acid-containing foods. Uh, so rather than having mm. 300 grams steak with dinner, we're just going to reduce that. Mm -hmm. Rather than having 12 eggs a day, we're just going to reduce that. <laughs> Mm. The exception here is seafood because seafood won't contain these high levels of arachidonic acid. Mm. They're going to be containing the omega-3s and the anti-inflammatory fats. So we can consume more of that. Okay, wonderful. So it's not about eliminating altogether. It's just about reducing and increasing fibre and things like that too at the same time. Yeah. So it's about changing the cellular membrane mm. of the arachidonic acid to omega-3 ratio. So, you know, I'd be bringing in the fish oils. If they've had a history of consuming too much ara arachidonic acid, I might go testing um, their bloods to see what is their makeup of different fats on mm. a, uh, a cell membrane and go, well, we need to increase omega-3s of the plant-based omega-3s or, or fish-based uh, omega-3s. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you were talking about, you mentioned dysbiosis, intestinal permeability, inflammation and immune dysregulation as that, those four modifiable risk factors and that perfect storm for an autoimmune disease to take place. Is there always dysbiosis in an autoimmune condition? Interesting. So it's one of these perspectives where um, a lot of patients with an advanced 
autoimmune condition, especially if it's within the gut, will have some form of, of dysbiosis, mm. right? But it's, it's, is it the chicken or the egg? Mm. Which one comes first? Does the dysbiosis drive the autoimmunity or does the autoimmunity drive the dysbiosis? Mm. And I would actually say it goes both ways yeah. in the sense where um, once that autoimmune disease has developed, then yes, there's going to be significant changes to the microbiome. Um, but we know from the research where changes in the dis in someone's microbiome will pre-perceive the onset of an autoimmune disease diagnosis. So we know that there's changes in the microbiome before an autoimmune condition is actually diagnosed. Mm, okay. So I want to talk about this a little bit more because I was having a lo little look at the research and I also oh. noticed exactly what you're saying, that so many of the researchers are observing that clusters of patients with the same autoimmune disease have similar patterns with regards to their microbial status, so with regards to their gut. So they're seeing reduced diversity and abundances of certain microbiota when compared to healthy controls. So, for example, a 2023 paper examining gut dysbiosis and autoimmune disease observed faecal bacterium was commonly depleted in individuals with autoimmune conditions such as lupus, multiple sclerosis and Sjogren syndrome. And basically the function of that faecal bacterium, they were saying, was to maintain homeostasis of the gut immune system because that bacteria secretes short-chain fatty acids such as butyrate, which is anti-inflammatory, which I just thought was so interesting. So when we don't have enough of that faecal bacterium, then we see alterations in immunity, increased inflammation, which then predisposes to these autoimmune conditions, which I, I just think is super interesting that they can see that on a test. Have you seen similar patterns with your patients and in the literature? Mm. So yes, a lack of butyrate is going to be very common in, in many chronic health conditions. Mm. But something that I will highlight here is looking at butyrate production mm. is a lot more clinically important than focusing on a few butyrate-producing species. So we as practitioners need to collectively assess how our patient's microbiome, how their capacity is to produce butyrate mm. um, and whether or not there's sufficient fuel source to feed those species to produce butyrate. So mm. it's more about the group of species and their abundance rather than um, classifying it as oh, this one particular species. Is there too mm. much or not enough of that? Mm. Now, what I find is a lot of practitioners are focusing on a few select genus mm -hmm. rather than the whole microbiome. So um, this, this causes this mentality around practitioners is I need to increase mm. X species or X genus. Mm -hmm. Now, I mentor lots and lots of practitioners, and they bring to me a variety of different um, microbiome reports. Mm. Um, and they go, my patient doesn't have acomantia or it doesn't have lactobacillus. I need to increase this. Yeah. <laughs> what I will tell you here is uh, I'm, I'm sure we've, we've spoken about my gut microbiome before. I like to say I that. I know. Look, I wanted golden... to mention this. <laughs> I wanted to refer to you as the man with the golden stool. <laughs> the golden stool. Um, it's, and not it's the, the stool running... that we sit on. <laughs> The running joke, you know, I, I grew up on a farm. I was uh, vaginally born, breastfed. I, I eat more plants than most people. My dinner last night, it had tempeh and lentils and chickpeas along with uh, cruciferous vegetables. It was like jam-packed. It also had brown rice that was cooked and cooled. We digress. <laughs> Where I'm going with this is I have measured my microbiome um, multiple times, okay, mm. and I measure the whole microbiome. I do not have any lactobacillus in my gut, right? So it's not about trying to increase one particular genus. Mm. It's about, well, let's take a step back and look at the whole microbiome and see how is that microbiome functioning mm. and what we need to do to support that whole microbiome rather than targeting a few genus here and there. Mm. So why don't you have any lactobacillus? I don't need it. My microbiome has adapted mm. um, in the sense of it's this common misconception. It's a, it's a whole can of worms when it comes around to uh, the classification of lactobacillus. Mm. So a number of years ago, what's happened is lactobacillus has actually been reclassified into over 25 
different um, uh, genuses and, and species. So what we thought was a lactobacillus in mm. research, which is older than 10 years, 10 years old, mm. isn't actually going to be lactobacillus because it incorporates 25 other genuses. So I, I, I probably do have a number of those other genuses mm. within my microbiome, but I don't technically have the lactobacillus genus within my microbiome because we've reclassified lactobacillus rather than looking at how it acts underneath a microscope we classify it on a dna perspective to go okay what is the the dna and and where does it fit within a uh, the the hierarchy of um, bacteria Mm, so interesting so interesting now i want to ask you about hashimoto's because Obviously, I've got an interest in it, but I do think it's one of the most common autoimmune conditions that we see within clinic. I was reading a 2020 study which observed that most individuals which with Hashis have gut dysbiosis, no surprises there for most of the clinicians listening, they found that the short-chain fatty acid producing ability of individuals with hypothyroidism was decreased, resulting in increased serum LPS levels. Um, another study I read observed decreased pre 9, which is known to enhance anti-inflammatory activities by reducing TH17 polarisation. So what you're saying is we would not target specific bacteria, but we would look at the microbiome as a whole in these patients. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Fantastic. So then if we were doing a gut analysis and we see things like low prevotella or low butyrate, basically this sort of testing is we're able to inform ourselves and I guess our patient that they could be at risk. Say they haven't been diagnosed with Hashimoto's yet, but we're seeing low butyrate. We're looking at this marker and thinking, okay, this marker when it's at the right level is usually anti-inflammatory. This patient's got low levels possibly we're seeing an increased risk for autoimmune disease. Okay, so there, there is some confusion here. Mm. And I think where you're applying is some particular genuses mm. or species have been linked with autoimmunity. So mm. they're, they're generally um, classified as uh, potential autoimmune disease triggers. Mm. And I believe um, a study that you quoted earlier on was Cheng um, 2023, and, and yeah. that, that was the one looking at all of the different um, penises and, mm. and linking it up with different autoimmunity. Mm. Now, something to consider here is that particular study and a lot of other studies mm. are only linking up genuses. So the genus of, of the bacteria, not oh, the yeah. species. Yes, okay. So, yeah, it's i give you the example of Streptococcus. Mm. In that particular research, um, as I recall, they linked Streptococcus, so high amounts of Streptococcus, the genus, not the species, the genus, to multiple sclerosis, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis. Mm. Now, Streptococcus is an interesting one because... Yes, you know, we could potentially contribute to as a, a, a trigger for autoimmunity, but it can also be what we refer to as a oral species. Yeah. Now, when I say oral species, these are microbes that are found within your um, oral cavity. What happens is they can actually be found within a stool test. How do <laughs> bacteria from the mouth transit all the way down through the stomach acid, through the intestines, and be found in a stool test. It comes down to high amounts of oral species on a stool microbiome test can actually indicate a lack of stomach acid. Mm, that's exactly what I was thinking. Hmm. So, so here's this thing. Is it actually the, the, the microbiome or mm. is it further up going, hey, we need to address stomach acid, mm. right? The other one here when it comes around to linking particular genuses, not necessarily species, but particular genuses with an autoimmunity is how we name species. Mm. A lot of species contain the wrong name. So when you actually dig into the methodology of a research article that's looking at microbiome sequencing, we want to evaluate what database they use to name the species. So there's a number of different databases. The two main databases is what's referred to as the GTDB. Um, It's a database set up by the University of Queensland, and it's actually regarded as the most accurate and comprehensive database for accurately naming species of bacteria. But 
We've also got this database called the NCBI, right? And that's what a lot of um, labs will actually use to name their bacteria and what a lot of researchers will use to name their bacteria. Mm -hmm. But they actually misclassify so many different species. So the research article might say um, Prevotella copri, but is it actually Prevotella copri or is it it something else? Oh, my gosh, that's insane. It's so confusing. So where I'm going with this is Mm. from a research perspective, we've got to look at the methodology and understand Mm. what database they're using. But then when we're interpreting a microbiome report, we've got to understand what database are they actually using because they may be reporting particular genus or species. Mm. But in fact, it's something completely different. The other one here is this linking particular species with a particular autoimmune disease. Mm. It sets up this mentality for practitioners where they go, I need to kill this. Yes. Where they go, oh, my patient has um, Tupsiella pneumoniae mm. or Prevotella copri. I need to kill it. So I'll give you the example of Prev- Prevotella copri. Now, this mm. is quite common. Um, I want to say about oh, maybe 5 maybe 10% of individuals will have what we refer to as a Prevotella copri dominant gut. That is where, you know, more than 10% of the microbiome is Prevotella copri. Mm-hmm. Now, this is classified as, as a pathobiont in the sense of it, it, it's linked up with a number of chronic health conditions and so forth. Mm. But there's interesting research out there that is almost going that next stage where going Prevotella copri might have um, an array of different strains. Mm. Remember, Prevotella copri is the species. Mm-hmm. They may have further strains, which we just don't know yet, yeah. where when they're fed a healthy whole food diet, mm. it's actually beneficial. Mm. But when you feed it a typical Western style diet, it's going to produce negative compounds. Mm. So similar so to somebody, Candida, right? Different strains. In a sense, I mean, that's another kettle of fish, <laughs> fish when we're talking about Candida and whether or not Candida is actually there or whether or not it's Candida that um, is grown because there's cross-contamination mm. and it's sitting in the post for too long. Mm. So, yeah, when somebody has high Prevotella copri, it's, it's emphasising a whole food, healthy diet mm. to ensure because that Prevotella copri, that's, it's not going to go anywhere. It's going to stay. We want to feed it the right amount of food. Mm. So to kind of get back to that original question on, you know, can we link particular bacteria with autoimmunity and and Hashimoto's, Mm. where I like to go here is with pathobionts. So a pathobionts is a microbial species which is associated with a negative health outcome. So it's been seen in cross-sectional data to be higher amounts in um, Hashimoto's or Mm. Crohn's disease or so forth compared to healthy individuals. Mm. What I want to express here is everyone has them. I have pathobionts. Even the, <laughs> the, the with practitioner the with the golden poo has got pathobionts. <laughs> it comes down to how much space they're taking up in the microbiome. Mm. So all of my pathobionts, how about we say my healthy patients, when they have pathobionts, they have it in a low abundance, mm. right? But when they are higher, I'm talking maybe two standard deviations higher than what we see in, in uh, unhealthy individuals or, or Um, healthy individuals, that's when it becomes a bit of a problem. That's when we go, well, hold on, why is this growing? And uh, one of the biggest things that we've actually found in in the research is to address these pathobionts, rather than coming in with um, that killing perspective, is if we actually feed up the beneficial bacteria, Mm. then that's going to change that, that, that level. So yes, in autoimmunity, I'm always looking for whether or not there's high amounts of these pathobionts. Mm. And if there are, I want to reduce their abundance by increasing the beneficial bacteria. Yeah, I love that approach and that's definitely the approach I take as well. So when doing a gut microbiome analysis, what markers in our gut can tell us that there is intestinal permeability and dysbiosis and inflammation and how can practitioners apply these results? Mm. Okay, so we've got a number of different markers here. So why don't we we break it down? Mm. What I will do is I'll start off with um, my favourite intestinal permeability and mm-hmm. then maybe we can dive into um, inflammation. Sure. So intestinal permeability, it is it's what I've dedicated many years of my life to. <laughs> um, I feel like when it comes around to evaluating intestinal permeability, 
in clinical practice, mm. yes, you've got stools on you. Something I want to classify here and, and re-educate practitioners on mm. is the reference range for zonulin. Mm-hmm. So as we see in, let's say, blood pathology, we have what we see um, on the pathology report and then we have our own, our own integrative reference ranges, which mm. are a bit more narrow. When it comes around to GI markers such as zonulin, calprotectin, mactoferrin, mm. how they are calculated is there is a line in the sand. If you're above it, you have it. You have permeability. You have inflammation. Mm. But if you're below it, you're not. The reason I bring this up is I see practitioners in either in my mentoring program or even on social media saying that somebody might have leaky gut when their zonulin is at 50. And we know that the the cutoff point is 107. Mm. If somebody has zonulin at 50, they don't have intestinal permeability, mm. right? It's not a scale. It is you've got to be over. Sure. Now, of course, if they're 106 or even 100, you know, being very close, yeah, I'll, I'll classify that as mm. intestinal permeability. But you you will not have zero on zonulin. You will not have zero to counterprotect them. That's just not how these markers yeah. work. Everyone has them. We yeah. need them. But it's when they become too high. Yeah. So similar to like even thyroid antibodies, people will always have them. It's just that they shouldn't be over the reference range or even close to that reference. There, there will always be some degree. Okay. So, so with zonulin, calprotectin, we should expect to see some. It will never be zero, but it just shouldn't be over the range. That is correct. Mm-hmm. So, and, and zonulin is one marker mm. when it comes around to assessing gut permeability. And we want to assess these markers in patients with autoimmunity because that will give us that indication of do we need to address intestinal permeability in clinical practice? Mm. Not everybody with intestinal permeability will have elevation in zonulin. Oh, that's interesting. So zonulin will only be increased when it's actively being stimulated. Mm-hmm. It's what we refer to as a, an acute phase protein meaning that it has a relatively short half-life. So you've got to stimulate it for it to be found. Mm. That is why I rely on other markers to give clues to whether or not there's intestinal permeability. Mm -hmm. These are going to be things like high secretory IgA, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Other compounds such as LPS within the microbiome, Mm -hmm. Um, butyrate, of course. Something to note here with butyrate is that... There's two ways to assess butyrate um, within the stool. Mm -hmm. We can look at the um, microbes that produce butyrate, Mm -hmm. and then we can also measure actual butyrate. Now, unfortunately, when we go measuring actual butyrate, this can actually be greatly impacted in a negative way based on our patient's transit time. Okay. Okay. In a sense of if you have a patient With constipation, Mm. a lot of the times their butyrate is going to come back as low. Mm -hmm. If you have a patient with diarrhea, a lot of the time the the butyrate is going to come back as high. Mm. That is not to say that somebody with constipation has got low butyrate. That is to say that somebody with constipation will be absorbing more butyrate because Mm. there's slower transit time and staying in the colon for longer, Mm. right? With somebody with with loose stools, it's going to be coming out. It's not going to be absorbed. So it's not giving us an an accurate depiction on butyrate status, Mm. whereby if we measure the microbiome, the capacity to produce butyrate, that's not going to be impacted by transit time. And it's going to give us a more accurate way to go, do you have species to produce butyrate mm. and do you not? And you combine that with the data from their diet. Mm. Are they consuming enough resistant starch? Are they consuming enough prebiotic fibers to feed up these species to produce butyrate? Mm. Right? We can also go a bit deeper here. Now, of course, hydrogen sulfide, another marker which is elevated, can be indicating intestinal permeability. Mm. But I really like to take butyrate and hydrogen sulfide, their results together. together. Mm-hmm. Hypothetically, if somebody had normal butyrate mm. or, or, or on the lower end but still within range, but they had high hydrogen sulfide, mm. I would still support their butyrate. This is because hydrogen sulfide will reduce the absorption of butyrate within the bowel. Okay. Which is just, it blows your mind where we need to um, collectively so look detailed. at all of these markers mm. rather than just one at the time. Mm. 
The other example here is going to be acetate. Now, acetate being another short-chain fatty acid, Mm. we haven't been able to find definitive links between acetate and intestinal permeability. Mm. But what we know is 24% of acetate will be converted to butyrate. So if somebody has low, like super low acetate and sub-low butyrate, I'm going to be saying, hey, I need to even further support this patient's butyrate Mm. because acetate isn't going to be helping out as Mm. much. Mm. And so let's just go back to butyrate because, and and talk about its role in autoimmune disease, because it, it, I was doing some reading on it and I was just went down a massive rabbit hole as usual, got so excited about it. It's a short chain fatty acid, reduce, it's anti-inflammatory, right? It's an immune mm-hmm. modulator. And so if we don't have enough of the bacteria that produce it, then again, if we see that on a blood test, I'm not a blood test, a stool test, we would be thinking, uh-oh, problems, foreseeing problems. Would you say that's right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And in, in, in the sense of butyrate is one of the, I would say, most important markers mm. when it comes around to, I won't say autoimmunity, but just within chronic health. Mm. And sometimes we fall into the, the relaxed approach of, oh, they're butyrate, we'll just give some prebiotic fibres to increase it. But mm. butyrate is so important where it works on signalling the immune system, uh, modulating gene expression. Mm. Uh, it can impact inflammatory cascade. Mm. So butyrate, even when suboptimal or even when optimal, we do need to continue to address it. Can I ask you then, because you've brought up a really good point. Okay, where I'm getting at is that I had a patient with low butyrate and I was talking to colleagues and they were saying, oh, you can just get a butyrate capsule and Mm. take it. And I was thinking in my head, this doesn't make sense to me because they're not getting the food (laughs) and the prebiotics. But then I was looking at some research and they do give butyrate capsules. But again, I didn't go there because I was kind of like, oh, my God, I'm talking to Brad. I'll just ask him. (laughs) <laughs> well, first of all, in Australia, we don't have access to butyrate capsules, mm-hmm. but they are available elsewhere mm-hmm. um, in, in the world. Um, what the research shows is, yes, they are very beneficial in the sense of it will have the same action as butyrate, but at our core philosophy mm. is address the cause. We are integrative and holistic healthcare practitioners. If it takes a little bit longer, it takes longer, but I mm. want to address the, the underlying cause. Mm. Now, something that, you know, a lot of practitioners will struggle with is my patient can't tolerate fibres, mm. right? Now, I'm on a bit of a bandwagon at the moment on we need to um, increase fibre in, in the diet. I'm, mm. I'm reading fibre field at the moment. And from a practitioner perspective, it's, 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 it's basic, but from a patient perspective, amazing. You know, mm. I very much support a lot of what um, uh, he's saying in the book. But where I'm going with this is our microbiome, if we don't provide it with that diversity, mm. with sufficient fibre, it will actually lose the ability to break down fibre. Mm. A lot of the enzymes required to break down fibre are found in our microbiome, not within ourselves right? And we know here that the release of digestive enzymes Mm. is a positive feedback loop. Mm -hmm. The more that we put into our body, the more that it will signal our body to release these enzymes. Mm. If we remove FODMAPs, if we remove major Mm. food groups from our diet, our Mm. body will produce less and less of these digestive enzymes. That's one component. And then the other one here is our microbiome will forget how to digest and break down fibres. Mm. So I described before my, my dinner last night, I'm going to be able to just tolerate this, no problems at all. I'm not going to get any bloating. And mm. sure, but that's because I eat it on a regular basis. Mm. But if I had patients who, you know, suffered from bloating and digestive issues and if they consumed that fibre-rich meal, they would be in agony. Yeah. Where I'm going with this is we need to start low and slow mm-hmm. to the point of starting with a, a, an eighth of a teaspoon of well-cooked lentils mm-hmm. and over a one-year period increasing that to half a can. Okay. So it's a we long-term thing, a one-year period. Mm-hmm. Look at true food allergies. 
right? Eggs. We can now have children who are anaphylactic and allergic to eggs. Mm. We can actually retrain their immune system mm. to be able to tolerate eggs. But what they do, they start off with a egg that is boiled for like 15, 20 minutes and, and you eat like an eighth of a teaspoon. And that's what and you do it every single day. You just slowly work your way up along with, you know, probiotics and yeah, so forth and yeah. the gut repair. Um, but you get to that point where you can eat a, a, a nice runny egg on sourdough bread. Yeah, super interesting. So it's about building up slowly that tolerance and the immune system becomes mm-hmm. more capable. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. Great. So then can we talk more about hydrogen sulfide? Because I didn't actually know much about it till I did a bit of reading. And basically it's produced, metabolite produced by bacteria, right? Hydrogen sulfide. Mm -hmm. Is it responsible if a patient, if we, I I mean, I know we're going to do the stool test, but if a patient was getting gas that smelt like sulfur, could we assume they have an excess of hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria or is that a bit too much of a stretch? Listen, we've got to go with the rule of three. You know, if, if we evaluate their diet, we, if, if we evaluate their, their, what they say about their gas, mm. where I'm going with this rule of three, 100%. If someone can't afford a microbiome test, mm. I will use these, these clinical indications. Now, hydrogen sulfide, really, really interesting. Mm. The big one here is going to be cysteine. High cysteine-based foods is the fuel source to produce hydrogen sulfide. Okay. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. NAC, N-acetylcysteine, yeah. one of my favorite amino acids for insulin resistance and um, detoxification and you name it. Mm. It's, it's an amazing amino acid. But I've had a few patients who have adverse reactions to NAC. You know, they, they, they can't tolerate it. Mm. All their rotten eggs, the, 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 <laughs> the gas, gas smells more like rotten eggs. Mm. Um, and it comes down to they've got too many hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria in mm. their gut. Mm. And then they're adding in this cysteine, which is feeding that up. Mm. So before I prescribe um, NAC or even high cysteine rich foods, I will double check their microbiome to go, oh, can you tolerate that? Yes, mm. no, and then I'll prescribe that. Mm. Um, so th- that's one of the biggest things that we can do if somebody has high amounts of hydrogen sulfide is to reduce cysteine-based supplements, mm. to reduce cysteine in the diet. But the other alternative here is FOS. So FOS being a, a fermentable carbohydrate, mm. the so- research does indicate that increasing that in the diet will reduce these hydrogen sulfide-producing bacteria. Ah, interesting. So that's the fructo-oligosaccharides. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what do you usually use in clinic in terms of dose and length of how much you, you know, how much someone has to take for how long? I'm I'm with FOSS. I usually do it through the diet. Okay. From the perspective of it's available. Mm. There are so many different foods that contain FOSS that are just Let's eat a diverse diet, eating 20 to 30 um, different plants each and every week. You know, mm. we'll address that. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to go back to hydrogen sulfide again and just, I guess, emphasise that it is associated with increased gut inflammation, isn't it? Like higher levels. Mm-hmm. Gut so, inflammation permeability. Yeah. So if we see that on the test, that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. No, we don't want... I mean, we want a little bit, mm. but we don't want too much, mm-hmm. okay? It's, if, if it's there, fantastic, but if it's too high, um, then we want to bring that down. Okay, good. So, and we use the FOS for that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Do you think that some patients with IBD symptoms post-consumption of sulfur-containing foods, then that, that's less to do with the FODMAPs and more to do with increased hydrogen sulfide or that's something different? Mm, it could be either mm-hmm. in the sense where it, it really could be either. And the patients are so unique mm. um, that it, it could be both. All right. So if we do a little summary, so zonulin, if we're looking at intestinal permeability in these markers, zonulin has to be completely, well, it needs to be out of the reference range. It's an acute phase marker for mm-hmm. intestinal permeability and activation of zonulin we could think of is a defence mechanism by the immune system to flush out bacteria. I think I've read some yes, studies say. Correct, yes. mm. The other thing I actually thought of 
is last time we spoke, you really emphasised that zonulin has to be measured in the gut, not blood. Yes. As a lot of research papers do, they measure blood. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's the thing. Always, the abstract might say zonulin, mm. but go down to the method section and go, was it stool zonulin or was it serum zonulin? Mm. Have you ever had a patient with an autoimmune disease where you've done their stool test and they haven't had any notable gut symptoms, but there have been major discrepancies on their gut uh, analysis? Mm, okay. So it comes down to how accurate and comprehensive the test being used is, mm. which will determine that. So I recall in my early years in practice, I'm talking 2008, 2010, 2012, when metagenomic sequencing just it wasn't available there was no test globally i believe or definitely not in australia that offered metagenomic sequencing so i would be utilizing anodate anodate methods for measuring the microbiome and there would be many reports where it would come back either of two things where it's like oh this doesn't mean anything or oh your gut is fine but now that I actually use and we have access to metagenomic sequencing, it's providing that more accurate and comprehensive information. I'm able to use this information to direct treatment approach mm. and to get that further understanding of the microbiome. So, yes, you know, there's a sense of um, about 40% of my patients that I do a gut test with will not have digestive issues, mm. right? We often think, uh, um, digestive issues got to do a stool test. But in a lot of cases, like uh, hormonal cases, uh, mental health, poor immunity, even the worried well, um, when there's a autoimmune condition outside of the gut, like RA, multiple sclerosis, lupus, mm -hmm. I would be using a gut microbiome test to give me an, uh, an understanding. This is because we can see markers within the gut, mm -hmm. which are linked with systemic inflammation. We know that systemic inflammation is linked with mental health, hormonal issues, um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. And we can understand whether or not the microbiome is driving systemic inflammation. Mm, that's so interesting because I think for me as a practitioner, I often do blood testing and ESR, CRP, markers of inflammation often show up normal, even though someone can have a raging autoimmune condition and the patient mm -hmm. reports feeling very inflamed. So the gut can obviously inform us not just about intestinal inflammation, but also systemic inflammation, it seems. Yeah. So one thing that I'll note here is ESR, CRP, they are really the only markers that we can do through the GP, but mm. you can do a more comprehensive panel where you're looking at all of these different cytokines. What I've observed using that type of panel is sometimes there'll be markers out of range. But when somebody's like on the verge of not really inflamed, then there's not going to be markers out of range. So if ESR, CRP are kind of like suboptimal, then I may do this panel to, to see inflammatory markers. But I will also evaluate the markers within the gut microbiome that can indicate systemic inflammation. Mm. And what are some of these? Yeah. So some of these markers that we can look at, so these microbial metabolites that our microbiome produces can be linked with systemic inflammation will be things like your branch chain amino acids. Mm -hmm. So there was a, um, a research study um, and the title was Association of Plasma Branch Chain Amino Acids with Biomarkers of Inflammation and Lipid Metabolism in Women. And what this particular um, article found was there was an association with systemic um, branch chain amino acids mm. and a variety of different inflammatory markers such as CRP. Now, our microbiome produces these branch chain amino acids, mm. which can then drive uh, systemic inflammation. So that's, that's one marker that I'll look at. But when it comes around to that marker, it's important to evaluate their weights, their level of exercise to really determine what direction of treatment you might go. So mm. if somebody is overweight, it's going to be about increasing uh, their exercise to be able to utilise those branched chain amino acids. But if somebody's having a very healthy diet and they are exercising quite often but they've got elevation in branched chain amino acids, mm. then it's actually not a problem because it's not going to be a risk factor. It's when we apply these results to the individual. Mm. 
So another one here is going to be TMA or trimethylamine. Now, our microbiome can produce TMA from consuming carnitine and, and choline within the microbiome, whether it's through supplements or whether it's through the diet. It goes into circulation and it converts to TMAO, okay, mm -hmm. a compound um, which has been linked with cardiovascular disease, inflammation. Um, I actually had a patient who had huge levels of this. I'm talking mm. the highest levels I've ever seen. Now, he was a 46-year-old male and he was the eldest living member in his family because his brother, uncle and father all died of a cardiovascular event before the age of 45. Oh, my gosh. Wow. So could the microbiome <laughs> be contributing to heart disease? Mm, I wonder. We know that <laughs> our microbiomes are very similar within families. Mm. Um, interesting. So what did I do for this particular patient? Well, we know cruciferous vegetables will actually block the conversion of TMA to TMAO. Mm. So whenever we're having a carnitine-rich meal, a choline-rich meal, we want to be incorporating broccoli, lots of broccoli, some, some kale, if you enjoy that, cabbage, <laughs> Brussels sprouts, and so forth. Um, we can also take dim um, mm. if, if it's quite high as well to, to stop that conversion. And then other markers for systemic inflammation from a microbiome perspective is hex LPS. We, we know a lot about that. Mm. And then also um, microbial diversity, so low diversity. Mm. Something to note here is, yes, there's a few research articles out there to link low microbial diversity with systemic inflammation, but there are hundreds of research articles linking low diversity with chronic disease. Yes. What's that underlining factor for chronic disease is going to be inflammation. Mm -hmm. Do you ever use omega threes then? Of course, mm -hmm. when there are um, when there is obvious inflammation, especially mm. when it's evident on blood tests, I will use a combination of omega-3s and also your, your SPMs to mm. really resolve that inflammation and bring it down. Because whenever there's inflammation there, mm. we know that biochemical pathways, everything else is, is just going to exacerbate. As I mentioned before, mm. the four modifiable risk factors for an autoimmune disease, mm. one of them being inflammation, we need to bring that down. Mm -hmm. And yes, um, your SPM molecules, your omega-3s, they are going to be amazing mm -hmm. at resolving and so A, resolving the inflammation, but then B, changing that cellular structure, that mm -hmm. makeup of fatty acids and then there's less inflammation for years to come. Yeah, and probably the SPMs are more indicated in that autoimmune picture than the omega-3s because often I think where there's that low-grade inflammation or even high-grade inflammation, we're not converting them, we're not converting the omegas to the SPMs. And exactly. So what I would generally do is SPMs first, mm. bring down that inflammation once things are under control mm. from an inflammatory perspective, utilizing blood tests, then I would then trans transfer um, them to omega-3s. Mm. Okay. So we're at the therapeutics. Let's talk about SB, Saccharomyces boulardii, because for me, it's such a multitasker when it comes to autoimmune disease. How do you use it and how? I love SB. Mm. Um, Saccharomyces boulardii, it is, it's in most of my treatment plans. Mm. Um, it's like, it's one of those core recommendations that I give, especially when there's gut inflammation, mm. when there's intestinal permeability, mm. when there's immune dysregulation from so many different perspectives. So in patients with, let's say, inflammatory bad disease, sometimes they're on and off antibiotics. So very important in and around antibiotic use. And it's one of those things I, I tell them, keep it in the cupboard. If you feel some pain going on in your gut and you know that you'll, you have to go on antibiotics soon mm. after visiting the GP, start taking the SB. Mm. But when it comes around to intestinal permeability, um, there's a lot of conflicting evidence out there for a lot of different supplements, but there were a few. And SB, glutamine and zinc were the main supplements that kind of shone mm. from that perspective of uh, there is high quality evidence to support their use for intestinal permeability. Mm. We know that um, SB will support with um, microbial diversity. Mm. It supports with increasing secretory IgA. It can prevent the adhesion 
of pathogenic bacteria and even pathobionts onto the, the intestinal cell wall. Mm. So it's one of those really essential interventions that we can utilise. Yeah, I love it for that. So many different functions. And, you know, I had a look at the research and there's not a whole lot of research in specific autoimmune conditions. They're, they're starting to do some research with in humans with multiple sclerosis, but there's there's not that many papers where they've given just a Saccharomyces boulardii. But, you know, coming back to those four points that you talked about in your paper, the inflammation, dysbiosis, um, intestinal permeability and immune dysregulation, as you said, there's lots and lots of research there. What do you do or have you encountered this in a patient, I'm thinking about a patient I had last week, who I've given SB2 and they are reacting with bloating and things like that? Has, have you come across that? Interesting. What I can say is all patients are unique. It comes down to whenever there is a reaction, I will mm. say, pull it out, okay, give it three to five days, wait uh, to see if the reaction um, reduces. Mm. Now, I will always try it again, as long as it wasn't like an IgG immune mm. response. Try it again because sometimes what can happen is after a patient sees us as, as a practitioner, they change quite a lot in their diet. They, they change this in their diet. They take that supplement. They start exercising more. A lot's going on. A lot's changing. Um, so sometimes the combination of all of them can contribute to that. Mm. I haven't seen SB in itself contribute to bloating per mm. se, um, but it's one of those things where maybe start at a slower dose or yeah. take it after a meal or when someone is more inclined to have a reaction, I will prescribe it um, at night um, mm. and then I find that to be less um, impactful because they're sleeping. That's a great idea, actually, nighttime prescription. I do think it was dose-dependent because it was a high dose that she could just she, – she was inclined to take it because it was just a one-a-day kind of situation. But mm-hmm. I think maybe for her the lower – dose more frequently would have been beneficial. Mm. Yeah. So then what about other probiotic strains? Yeah. So this is a really interesting one. Of course, we need to move away from this perspective of my patient has Mm. low um, uh, lactobacillus, I've got to prescribe lactobacillus Mm. because we know that they don't necessarily stay. You know, they're, they're quite transient. In saying that, Probiotics are incredible at changing the environment in the gut. Mm -hmm. If we change the environment in the gut, then the species, your microbiome, will then flourish. They will have more favorable environment to grow and thereby the the beneficial species will grow. Um, So I'm more of a prescriber of probiotics. I I use them all the time. Mm -hmm. A nice multi-strain, well-researched probiotic for a gut health protocol, but not necessarily to add lactobacillus in, but mm. for it to have a, an immune modulating effect or to increase secretory IgA mm. or to um, impact uh, intestinal inflammation. I'll do it to change the environment in the gut. Mm. Lovely. And how long do you do generally with your SB and your probiotics? And do you start off with just SB and then do probiotics? I'm interested in your regime. And so this is quite interesting. So I I did some research on this very topic a number of years ago Mm. in the sense of how long should practitioners be prescribing a gut repair protocol for? Mm. My gut protocol will be three months. I might slightly chop and change things about two months, um, but they will generally be on on a gut protocol for for upwards of three months. Mm, Lovely. Okay, so any other supplements you think are worth mentioning that you use? There are a lot that I would use. (laughs) Um, I I do like my prebiotic fibres for Mm. changing the microbiome. I think they are are key. Something that I will note here is a diverse prebiotic fibre is going to be more effective for the microbiome in some cases than just one prebiotic Mm fibre. So sometimes what can happen is if we just use one prebiotic fiber for too long, mm. that can actually reduce diversity because we're only feeding up a select number of species. We actually want to, to and this is where diet comes into, but have um, prebiotics, whether it be a supplement or from the diet, uh, a variety of different sources so then we're feeding up the whole microbiome. Mm. Okay, so cycling, say GOS and PHGG and things like that. Yeah, if- inulin and mm. um, beta-glucans. Um, either from the diet or through um, supplement, that's going to be ideal. Lovely. 
Now, I've seen you jogging. <laughs> I remember we were at a conference and I was stumbling to get a coffee and you had returned all fresh and chirpy from your morning jog. What about lifestyle strategies <laughs> and the gut? <laughs> Lifestyle factors for autoimmunity, and this is going to be key. So there's a lot that we can do here. Mm. Now, we know how important vitamin D is Mm. for for autoimmunity, for regulating um, our immune response. If it's low, we're going to be supplementing. We're going to be supplementing to increase it. But once it's at above 100 nanomoles per litre, we want to ensure safe sun exposure. Now, there's apps that you can download on your phone that can tell you, um, go out in the sun for 12 minutes and expose this percentage of your body, and that will be your vitamin D requirement. So I recommend that type of app. The other one that I do from a lifestyle perspective is to stimulate the vagus nerve. Mm. The vagus nerve is what connects the gut to the brain, the brain to the gut, and there's a lot that we can do. Of course, you've got your bitter herbs, but I love telling my, 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 my patients to sing, to oh. hum, and to chant the word OM. Actually chanting OM, so OM, that vibration in the back of the throat will stimulate the vagus nerve. Mm. Have you ever thought about these you know, um, Indian gurus who will sit around and drink sugar-rich chai tea all day, but they will live to like 100 years old? But they spend hours and hours chanting on. So I wonder whether or not (laughs) stimulating the vagus nerve overcomes that high amount of sugar in their diet um, to the point that they are in an anti-inflammatory state. Mm. Well, I know in Ayurvedic medicine they do believe that we have the sweet taste for a reason. So, yeah, and then the OMS, okay. Very good. And then, of course, stress management. Mm. I can't. I can't emphasize this enough. Now, I've started probably for the last six months now been using a recommendation, and I think you're going to really like this recommendation, and I've had some amazing feedback from patients. So this recommendation stems from, and you must uh, uh, excuse me, I've forgotten his name. He was a neuroscientist that presented some amazing research Mm. at the 8th Annual NIM Conference down in uh, Melbourne in uh, 2023 on... Um, the benefits of colouring in. Mm-hmm. Okay, Stan, so he Stan shared Rodsky. all of this research mm. where colouring in will change your brain waves. Mm. So what I tell my patients is to spend twenty minutes every single night colouring in with with your family if you've got family. It has two things. It supports with a healthy sleep cycle. Mm. So rather than getting on the technology or watching telly, but then it also allows you to bounce back from a stressful situation more effectively than if you weren't. Mm. So adult colouring in, I actually have my my book, my adult colouring in book, and you know, I'll show it to patients. They love it. They love the suggestion. Um, the other one is what I find is whenever I'm mentoring late at night or I'm seeing like patients or I'm doing presentations, you know, in the, you know, late late at night because you know, other side of the world, I will always go. Before bed, let's do the colouring in. Bring yourself down because, unfortunately, I can't meditate in the sense of my mind runs around at 100 (laughs) miles an hour. So my style of meditation Mm. is colouring in. Mm. My advice is to invest in good quality pencils because (laughs) I started off with just, you know, just your usual pencils. It It wasn't doing it for me, so I spent the money and I got good quality pencils. Amazing. Mm, lovely. I do I do think it's really important for patients to be acknowledging that winding down, that social support at, and the impact that does have on their gut. It's definitely what I focus on in my clinic. I see a lot of patients with prolonged sustained stress and that is the real driver to that immune activation Mm. and you know we know now that stress psychological stress does impact the gut microbiome I think a lot of patients don't realize that they think it's just about what they're eating but most definitely psychological stress has been shown to increase intestinal permeability and change the microbiome increase that pathogenic bacteria decrease the good stuff and you know short term that's not an issue but long term most definitely 
I love all those suggestions. I'm, I'm, I'm having a vision of you colouring in and omming at the same time. Um, <laughs> you know, I think our knowledge of the microbiome is constantly evolving. It, it wasn't a thing when I was at university. We didn't we didn't learn about the microbiome at all. I'm interested. What is an upcoming area within the study of the gut that you're excited about that practitioners should be aware of? Oh, you know what? For the very first time ever, and this is not just in Australia but globally, Mm. for the first time we as practitioners, we have access to metagenomic sequencing of the microbiome in combination with functional markers. Now, you may not think that this is quite a novel area, But this has never been done before in the sense of we've only ever just looked at um, metagenomic markers Mm. or we've only just looked at um, functional markers. But for the very first time in clinical practice, we as practitioners, we can access the combination of the two. So I'm really excited from this grassroots perspective Mm. because we need to acknowledge that our, our knowledge as clinicians, is a form of, of, of evidence. I want to know what are the links between um, um, high-quality metagenomic sequencing and zonulin or calprotectin. Mm. I want to understand the patterns that we see within the microbiome. This is, this is novel. This is the first time it's ever been done, and we in Australia have access to it for the very first time. And so it's, it's exciting because it's providing a comprehensive assessment of the microbiome and the environment, which is not just comprehensive, but accurate. And and I think that we are going to learn so much about this ecosystem from this year and for years to come Mm. using this grassroots perspective. Mm, Very exciting. I'm excited. Thank you so much for joining us today, Brad. As usual, you have been a wealth of information and just so generous with it. I think the key points I'm taking away are increasing fructo oligosaccharides to decrease that excessive hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria, increasing cruciferous veggies to block TMA to TMO, colouring, omming, and of course looking at the microbiome as a whole rather than focusing too much on just individual species and genus. Thank That's you, Brad. excellent summary, Lisa, and it's been a privilege chatting with you, and I look forward to um, catching up with you soon. Thank you, everyone, for listening today. Don't forget that you can find all the show notes, transcripts, and other resources from today's episode on the FX Medicine website. I'm Lisa Costabeer, and thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. This podcast is intended as healthcare practitioner education only, and it is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to FX Medicine, and share us with your family, friends, and colleagues.